Hey folks, it's Tommy Z back again, and today we dive into part two of our Making Music for Brands mini class. We have five parts, and today is number two, which we call orientation. And today we're going to discuss the essential traits, skills, and tools that you're going to need if you want to succeed in our business. Okay, folks? So let's dive right into it. The first thing I want to say is that it's not just about your skill. Of course, everyone that wants to join our business has to be a remarkable musical craftsperson. But in our business, so much of it has to do with the creative connection, with the kind of craftsperson that you are. So much of what you accomplish in this business and the type of people you will get to connect with and the type of people that will trust you is because of the kind of person that you are. And that's something that you can cultivate. So I've thought long and hard about all the people that I choose to work with in my business, all of my peers who are music producers who uh, hire musicians and what they look for. And I've basically gotten it down to seven R's, okay? Okay. Remarkable, rapport, responsive, reliable, res resourceful, radiant, and resilient. And I want to cover each of these in a little bit of a detail, okay? So the first thing is, you know, a lot of people send me music. A lot of people are so attached to their own work that they don't really judge themselves against the standard. It's like they're head down in the studio working on their song. The song is precious to them. But you have to judge your ability and what you're doing as a craftsperson in relation to the world, in relation to the marketplace, in relation to what's going on. And the quick question that I want to ask you and be brutally honest with yourself is, is what you're doing worth remarking about? That's what the word remarkable is about, right? Is what you're doing is who you are as a person worth remarking about? Everybody has access to music tools today, so we have a lot of musicians today, but we don't have a lot of magicians today, okay? And that's what me and my peers in, in our business are looking for, somebody who is outstanding. They stand out from the sea of sameness of all these musicians who just keep doing the same similar sounding stuff. That's not what we're looking, folks. That's not what we're looking for, folks. We're looking for somebody whose work and whose presence as a creator is something worth remarking about. Now, how do you become remarkable? And this is something that I've talked about many times in the various presentations that I've given at various creative conferences. And so I believe that we are all followers. It's not a question of if we follow we are going to follow. The question is, who are you going to follow? And so if you want to put yourself in a position to become somebody who is worth remarking about and your work is something worth remarking about, you need to first set your standards really high. You need to have heroes in high places, okay? And then you need to aspire to be like the best in our business and not just aspire, which means dreaming and wishing, but you need to perspire, to be like your heroes, which means actually put in work to try to bridge the gap, the gap that exists between your talent and the gap that exists between your ability. And this is a concept that Ira Glass, the producer of This American Life, has come up with. And you can Google Ira Glass. In fact, I encourage you to look up that speech about the gap. And that's the gap that he's talking about, is that when you're um, developing your taste, you will obviously like to listen to, let's say, the best uh, musicians that we've ever heard in, in our history. And so your taste will become very high, but then there will be a difference between what you consider great and your ability to reproduce something like this. And so I believe in order to be a remarkable craftsperson, somebody that will be of interest to other people in the industry, you will always need to fill that gap to a certain degree. You will always need to keep elevating your taste and then keep trying to match your skill set to it, which will be hard work. But if that gap doesn't exist, it means that you're not growing. OK, the second thing that I want to talk about is you are what you eat. OK, 
all of the ideas that you will have, your taste, the things that you will produce will always be as a result of the things that you have consumed. Okay, we don't create in isolation. We don't develop ourselves as human beings in isolation. Okay, so make a conscious effort to read great books, to study um, the greatest music ever made, to surround yourself with things that have been considered by other people who know what they are talking about to be um, the highest forms of art. Okay. The thing is, when you get used to the easy, the cheap, the shallow entertainment, then just like with sugar, you're going to crave more of it. And what are you going to produce when you eat nothing but shallow, sugary stuff? You're going to produce nothing but lollipops. And I don't think you want your legacy to be lollipops. And so I want you to consciously try to elevate yourself to the level of masters in whatever area of fascination that you have. I'm assuming I'm speaking mostly to musicians. So pick your heroes and then try to understand what drove their fascination, what drove their life's work, and then also what drove their specific tactics in the studio. What was their philosophy in the studio? Then try to copy it because if you can copy what they're doing technically, then that means that technically speaking, your craft is now at a certain level. And then if you are truly hungry to add something of your own to our humanity, to add something of your own to the history of music production and recorded music, then I'm sure it will be inevitable that you will add your own DNA. All right? So the questions I want you to ask to keep honestly checking yourself whether what you're doing and who you are as a person is worth remarking about is what is going to be your life's work, number one, and number two, will you be proud to show it to your grandchildren? For instance, I work in advertising, okay, so it's not like we're saving the world or anything like that, but even then, I want to do the kind of commercials that other human beings will actually enjoy, that my grandkids will take a look at and go, wow, that was really cool, Grandpa, right? That's my uh, aspiration in this business, to create timeless work that I can show my grandkids. So that's the first thing. Try to be a person who is not only doing remarkable things, but who is actually a remarkable craftsperson themselves. The second thing that I notice in people who are successful in our business is that they develop rapport really easily with others. And that's probably because they are already at a certain level. They are already the kind of individuals that we want to talk about, okay? Because building great rapport with other people is simply a result of who you already are. So if you are a remarkable person or somebody who has potential to be, then other remarkable people will want to be around you. Think about it. You don't want to be around somebody who is lower uh, than you are in this video game of life, right? Who doesn't aspire to the same things. For instance, if you want to live a constructive life, you want to constantly develop, you don't want to be around people who are dragging you down, right? Who are demotivating you, who are saying to you, why are you spending all these hours in the studio? You don't want those folks in your life, right? So, so this is really the key, that the quality of your rapport will really be the result of what kind of person you are, right? So what happens with the kind of people who develop rapport really quickly in our business? Well, they are remarkable. So they already form, uh, I form a great impression of them when they communicate with me. We have a strong handshake. I sense confidence. By the way, when I say handshake, I don't mean uh, physically. I mean virtually also. A lot of our communication happens virtually now. There's a way to have a strong handshake virtually. It's the way you email somebody. Is it clear? Is it confident? Is it compelling, your communication? Does it communicate somebody who is smart, somebody that I should pay attention to, right? Somebody that feels like a professional or at least somebody who has potential to turn into a professional. And a lot of times when I connect with these uh, composers or musicians who contact me, I feel like as if I'm on the same wavelength as them. So we tend to talk about our, the same heroes, the same artists that we listen to, the same art, 
we tend to have a similar sensibility, um, but that's not necessarily a prerequisite. I don't necessarily want to have the same taste as somebody else. I want somebody else to teach me, to inspire me, to sh so show me something new, right? And But generally speaking, I'm talking about standards, that we have similar expectations and standards uh, from our creative work, right? So that's how good rapport looks like. And how can you maximize your chances of uh, building rapport? So first, let's talk about what not to do. And I get emails every single day from musicians, and they make me sad because I can see that these guys have a very low chance of actually reaching any of the industry insiders in our business in a way that's going to build rapport. Why is that? Well, their emails are too self-focused. I literally get emails that say, like in one line, help me to get my music into a commercial. Help me to put my music into a film. Help me to put my song on the radio. I even get emails like that. I mean, it's honestly crazy that you would email me or any industry professional with a one-line email saying, help me, do what I want. And that's usually the focus of these emails, what I want, my music, what I want to do. Imagine me emailing an agency and saying, help me to put my music into one of your commercials. What I want is to get a lot of projects from you guys, okay? So, yeah, get on that. I mean, how in the world is that ever going to work with anybody? A lot of emails that I get are inarticulate. I, there are spelling errors. I'm not even sure that I know what those sentences mean that these folks are writing me. So I instantly delete, okay? But the biggest problems that I see in emails, are, are the musicians are simply too self-focused. They're not reaching out with me in mind. They're not reaching out with their audience in mind, but they're really focused on their own needs. And they're reaching out to somebody saying, please help me. That's not going to work in this business, folks, okay? So how do you actually build great rapport? It's very simple, folks. Strive, first of all, to be someone of substance, someone that I will want to talk to, someone that my peers will want to talk to. Be inspiring. Be knowledgeable. Care about the craft. Deepen your knowledge and your skill set about it. Communicate clearly and confidently when you reach out to us, when you reach out to us, but don't focus on yourself. Try to understand what are we doing? What are the problems that we are grappling with? And how does that match up with your skill set or your knowledge? And then offer your skill set or your knowledge um, to help us solve the problems that we're dealing with. I mean, if I get an email that says to me, I know you're struggling with this, this, and this, here's a thought. Here's, here's something that I thought about that maybe could help you. Do you think I'm not going to read that email? Of course I'm going to read that email. And I'm going to keep that person in mind, and I'm going to watch out for their emails. I might not respond right now because I'm busy, but I'm always going to remember that name as somebody who is helpful in their email. So the next time they email me, I'm actually going to pay attention. Whereas the other self-focused musicians who are just asking me for stuff, I mean, I don't even know you, instant allergy and instant like imprint in my brain to ignore those emails in the future, okay? So that's rapport. We have remarkable, we have rapport. So, so far, those are the two qualities that I see in musicians who are actually succeeding in our business. The next quality that's very important is being responsive, okay? So in our business, there are no second chances, folks. So when you reach out to somebody with clear, crisp, compelling communication that shows you're a pro or at least you have the potential to be, sometimes you might get an email back saying, oh, well, thanks for email me, emailing me. I'm actually working on this project. And um, I wonder if you have anything like this. So I want to tell you a story of Naren. Naren is a really busy composer in our world. And we were starting in this industry at about the same time. So he reached out to me like many, many years ago. I think it was like 13 years ago or so. And he was reaching out to other music production companies at the same time. And he tells the story in our masterclass of how those early days went. So essentially, he was sending out emails to music production companies with examples of some of his music, of some of his work. And he, met, he, he sent all these emails out, and then he was going on a trip. 
I think he was living in New York at the time and he was going to LA. Um, and when he got off the plane, all those emails he sent, maybe he sent like 15 or something like that, three or four of them got a reply. And the reply was, yeah, we're actually working on something right now and we're going to need something by Monday. So he's taking a weekend trip from New York to LA, not really expecting a response, but the response comes and it's like, okay, tough guy. Yeah, we'll take you up on your offer. Uh, do you have anything? Can you do, uh, can you make some music by Monday? So over the weekend. So here's Naren without a studio, without any gear. So what does he do? He's responsive. Instead of saying, oh, you know what? Actually, thanks, but I'm out of town and I have no uh, studio gear here. I, there's no way I can make music. So maybe we'll catch, uh, maybe we'll catch another chance. Nope, he didn't do that. Why? Because he's smart. He understands there are no second chances in this business. So he found a friend in L.A. Uh, who lent him a sound card, some gear, so he could actually record these demos. And 10 years later, folks, this is a guy who's making a living making music for brands. That's his occupation. Everybody knows Naren in our industry. But it just shows you the quality of this person, the responsiveness he didn't count on another, on another chance. He basically knew that he has to make the most of his first chance, okay? So remember that. In our industry, deadlines are deadly. Those who solve problems really fast will get called again. I mean, if, you, if, if I call you and you say to me, yeah, tomorrow, okay, sure, yeah, here we go. And I get decent solutions from you tomorrow, then I'm like, okay, there's another imprint in my brain. I can count on this guy to be responsive. So you got to think fast, you got to think clearly, and you got to think constructively. And the habit that you want to get into when somebody delivers you a problem, like a hot potato, and it's like, we need a piece of music and the deadline's tomorrow. Instead of rolling your eyes and saying, oh, you know, there's a hundred reasons why I can't get you this piece of music by tomorrow. Instead, you go, how can I get it done? And if I can't get it done, who do I know that can get it done? So when I respond, I can respond with a solution, okay? So that's being responsive. We have remarkable, we have building rapport easily because of the type of person that you are, and we have no second chances, so be responsive and offer solutions uh, very quickly, and people within this industry will remember you. The next thing I notice among successful musicians in our business is that they're reliable and responsible. Okay, so responsive is more about delivering uh, solutions really fast, even when it seems impossible. Being reliable and respons responsible talks more about a general attitude of owning the work or owning the problem that you're given. So in our industry, obviously, we're dealing with big brands, we're dealing with big budgets, we're dealing with big pressure. And there's a kind of a chain of trust that has to be linked. So the brand has to trust the agency. The agency has to trust all their creative partners, including the music production companies. And the music production company has to trust the musicians that they're about to collaborate with, right? And this trust is very fragile. I mean, there's often a sense of distrust between the brand and agency or the agency and the production house maybe because certain jobs are not going well or certain campaigns are not going well. And so trust is a really scarce commodity and a really precious and valuable thing that you can lose very quickly and it takes time to earn it, okay? But trust is essentially a fundamental fuel of your future success, of anybody's future success in the creative industry, okay? And the question that basically I ask myself when I'm working on something is, can I trust this musician, this human being to solve this problem well and quickly? And if the answer is yes, based, based on the track record that we've already had, then I call you. If the answer is no, I have a deadline to meet. I don't even think about it. It's like, nope, it's not going to happen. And if it's a kind of a maybe in my mind, well, guess what? Maybe I will call you. Maybe I won't. I probably won't. You know how it is with maybe, right? And so trust is really fundamental. And those composers, those musicians who prove themselves to be reliable and responsive over many different campaigns, not responsive, but responsible and responsive, who prove that they can own 
the problem and actually deliver a good solution, uh, time and time again, they build up trust. And then it's very hard to compete with that. You know, the best composers in our business basically have proven that they can be trusted. And so when new composers come along, it's like, nah, here I have a guy who I can trust 100%. Here I have a guy who's a big unknown, you know. So it's quite difficult. So what calls, what kills trust? Being unresponsive. So I sent you an email. I don't hear back, okay? This industry moves really fast. So people appreciate speed because if I don't hear from you, you're kind of leaving me hanging and I can't be left hanging. I need to find a solution. And so basically, I'm not going to trust you next time to give me an answer quickly if I know you don't answer your emails very quickly. Declining projects. So I've had cases where I wanted to work with a certain composer and every time I reached out to them, they were like, no, I'm too busy or no, I'm going away on a trip or no, I'm doing this and that. I still wanted to work with them, but in the interest of saving time, next time I had a campaign, I would just assume they're probably busy and I wouldn't even bother calling them, which is, you know, which is like unfortunate because because I really wanted to work with them and maybe we would have had um, some great projects together, but because they declined a few times, they didn't make themselves available, they weren't responsive, I was just like, you know, it's got nothing to do with their talent. I'm just going to assume that, you know, they're busy. They haven't shown me the level of responsiveness that I need to see in order to actually work with them. So, so that's another thing. Missing a deadline, folks, even by minutes, that's a big no-no. That's going to kill trust immediately. Even if you make a producer nervous, for instance, the demo is due tomorrow by noon, and at 11.57 the next day, I still don't have a demo from you, you're already putting me in a state of uncertainty, in a state of wondering, and that's not a comfortable feeling for somebody who's responsible for the sound of the campaign. And so imagine, do I want to surround myself with people who pull the trigger at the last minute? I don't need any more stress in my job, right? So I want to surround myself with people who will give me some cushion, who will send the demos early so that I have a chance to check them out, so that everything is happening at a reasonable pace for everybody to do their job properly, okay? So never miss a deadline. That's a big no-no. Um, I've worked with composers or even musicians who aspire to be composers in our business who will send me an incomplete delivery. So a file is missing or the file is broken. They send me a film, but there is no music. Huge no-no that kills trust. Broken links. I click on a link. It doesn't take me to the right file. Like imagine, folks, big pressure, big budget. I have to deliver to my client and now I have a broken link. I can't listen to the music. Like, imagine how much negative emotion that causes within me, the person responsible for the job. And these are such basic things that should never happen, right? So, and another one is one where I receive a piece of music and it's vastly different from everything that we spoke about. It's vastly different from the reference or from the brief or the things that we said we were going to do or that you were going to do are not the things that actually happened, okay? Okay. So that kills trust because that tells me maybe we're not on the same wavelength. Maybe we're not understanding each other. And, you know, we're not selling vacuum cleaners in our business. There has to be a certain understanding, a certain creative connection between collaborators so that I trust that what you consider good and the right thing to do creatively is actually going to be what I consider good and the right thing to do creatively, okay? So things like... Um, Poor deliveries. So picture and music being out of sync. For instance, in our master class, a lot of students will send me the, the homework where the music file or the music starts when the picture hasn't even started. And those are huge things. They might seem little to you, but they're huge. Because imagine if we have a composition that has to hit certain cues uh, down to a frame. Very specific points in the film have to match the music. Now, when you send me the music and it starts before the picture even starts, now I'm not even sure what's going to happen if I move the music to where it's supposed to be. With all, with, with, will all the sync points be suddenly out of place, right? So another thing is demos that are called in. We call it called in when we hear clearly that 
there's no magic in the demo. And this happens even to accomplished composers. When you're working with somebody and they send you a demo and you're basically expecting something based on past record. You know this composer. You know what they're capable of. And this demo just lacks luster. It lacks the power. It lacks the punch. It lacks the inspiration. And so we call that called in, you know. And with the accomplished composers, you will forgive them because obviously you can't nail every project. You can't nail every composition. It can't always be a home run. But even with accomplished composers, if that happens like one time, second time, third time in a row, you can imagine that the level of trust is going to be suddenly diminished and you're going to start calling into question their ability to produce magic. So things like mistakes in your music where you have notes that are off or noises that are not supposed to be there, bad sound in general, these are all things that you never want to do because they will kill trust. Another thing that will kill trust is poor attitude. So uh, there is a lot of unreasonable expectations in our business. In fact, today I got one. Okay, I got one from Japan where they were asking us to join the process because their music production company wasn't working out, but they really have no budget for demos and the demos will be due today. That's quite an unreasonable um, <laughs> request, but you could respond to it by rolling your eyes, by saying, why does this always happen? Why do you guys have to call me last minute? No. Instead, I replied, okay, well, tell me what your problem is, and we'll see if we can solve it quickly for you. Okay? That's a proper attitude. That's an attitude that shows the producer who's on the other end at the agency they're struggling. They have an emergency. Their music production company is not working out. They call me, and instead of rolling my eyes, I'm like, oh, you have a problem? Oh, it's due right now? Okay, l l tell me your problem. Let's see how we can uh, fix it, okay? So I've had composers who are geniuses, but when I call them and they have a revision to do, and it might be like the 11th revision because the client is not liking where the music is going, they start getting defensive, and they start complaining, and Imagine, that kind of energy is not something that I want in the process that is already stressful. So if I have a choice between a composer who is a genius and a good composer, um, I will choose the one who is good, not necessarily genius, because they might have a better attitude than the genius composer. Okay, Because I just find that attitude is so instrumental to a good, inspiring, creative outcome. Okay, you can't get anywhere if you're driving on a handbrake. And that's what I call bad attitude or complaining or resisting or being defensive. All right. And so what builds trust? It's obvious, right? Delivering on time, clear communication. The link is going to work. Your email is going to be clear. All the files are going to be in order. Music is going to be as expected, exactly what we discussed. And there's not going to be any mistakes anywhere. Trying to get a track to match you know, the, the thing that the client wants and to try to make something that is magical is hard enough already. We don't need to make basic mistakes to distract ourselves in the process, okay? So the next quality that I see in musicians who, um, who make it in our game and who are called time and time again is resourcefulness. So we deal with a lot of crazy stuff in this business. And when an advertising agency thinks of a campaign for the brand, Usually, it begins as a crazy, bold idea. Like, they literally want to change the world with this thing. They want it to go viral, and they want it done by tomorrow, okay? And so, again, being resourceful is really not about rolling your eyes and going, oh, here's another crazy idea from the agency, but instead, like, getting into it and being positive and saying, you know, how can we make this happen? to be constructive, to be open, to be willing, right? And a good habit to get into because naturally your body, your mind, everything wants to resist somebody who comes to you and says, we want to install 10,000 speakers tomorrow on the street and, and play this thing. And you're like, 10,000 speakers by tomorrow? Like, that's not going to work. But instead of saying that, get into a habit of saying, huh, could we actually pull this off? Like, how... How would I go about getting 10,000 speakers into the street tomorrow, right? And if I can't do this, who can do it, right? So it's this solution-oriented habit of asking yourself, how can we do this? Your creativity is refreshing to me 
Okay. That's like when I call a composer and I have a problem and I have crazy parameters to deal with. And I'm like, look, I need to record an orchestra by tomorrow. And I hear from the composer, really? Tomorrow you need an orchestra? Huh. Okay. Well, let's think about how I can do this. You know, I have a few ideas. What do you think I'm going to feel? I'm going to feel like, oh man, what a godsend this person is. I want him on my project every time I have a problem, right? I am refreshed by your creativity, by your resourcefulness. And there are students in the master class who landed their first big brand campaigns this very way that I'm talking about now. I had a Google campaign recently which needed an orchestra. It needed, uh, it wasn't actually an orchestra, but it was a quintet that had to play a very difficult classical piece and we had to deliver in like two days. And I knew one of my master class students named Matthias was somebody who could potentially be able to pull something like this off. I wasn't sure, but I called him. I let him know what the problem is. And he refreshed me with his attitude, with his approach, with his willingness to be resourceful, to think outside of the box, to get creative with solutions. And guess what? He sent me this very difficult to perform piece the next day. And that's how heroes are made in our business, folks, being resourceful, okay? Now, also, another point about resourcefulness is there's a lot of excited musicians. A lot of you guys are like little kids. You're amped up, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of endearing. It, I mean, it's fun to watch. But sometimes your enthusiasm and your crazy creativity is not enough because it's missing the mark. And so I've had situations where I had a very specific problem to solve and I call a musician and, you know, they get maniacal and crazy and they have these out there ideas, but these ideas don't actually hit the mark. Okay. They don't really, the ideas don't relate to reality. Okay. It's almost as if the problem that I have that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you, it's like you're in your own head. You haven't been able to get out of your head and actually understand what the problem is and understand what the parameters for a successful solution would be. But you're just in your head thinking up your crazy ideas, ideas which don't connect to the problem in a meaningful way. And that's something that that's the kind of resourceful that is not working. OK, in our business. All right. So we have resourceful. The next thing, radiant. Folks, our industry is very stressful. A lot of people are working long hours for months at a time at a campaign, at an advertising campaign. And you wouldn't believe how many ideas for campaigns get rejected at the agency level. So where the copywriter is thinking of different ways to, to do the campaign and literally like hundreds of ideas get rejected sometimes, okay? And even when their idea gets approved, the idea goes through so many revisions that by the time the revisions are done, they don't even recognize their original idea. I mean, a lot of corporate clients, a lot of brands, let's just say they're not the most creative people in the world. So sometimes they reduce really great ideas to, you know, their own uh, point of view, to their own taste. And, and that's why it can be very frustrating sometimes working with clients. There are many problems along the way. And so a lot of people in this business... After a while, you know, you kind of get tired and uninspired, okay? And so if you have other people around you who are also this way, so they, they complain about the clients and they're, they're complaining about, you know, the ideas not going through and blah, 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 you're actually adding to this negative energy, right? And so when I realized that, you know, the ad industry can be quite stressful and a lot of the people in this industry are tired and uninspired, I decided that in every interaction with my clients, with the people that I'm working with on the project, I would be a source not just of solutions, but of enthusiasm, of joy, of inspiration, of practical wisdom, and also peace. So when everybody's running around frantically, I'm the person who's trying, even in my emails, to get across a certain serenity, a certain peaceful tone. I'm still working very fast and efficiently, but I'm not going to add to the negative energy. And thereby, I hope 
that some of the people that choose to work with me time and time again is because of that energy that I bring into the project. It's something that they want to be around. And I believe that we need this more than ever because the world we live in now, you know, there's so much uncertainty, so many troubles, and and I believe that when we choose to work with certain people in these difficult times, uh, their attitude and how they conduct themselves as human beings is going to play a large part in you know, how we feel about working with them and ultimately what kind of a creative result it's going to produce. Okay, So like I mentioned before, I don't care if somebody's a genius. Okay, I'm not going to work with them if they're going to be grumpy. And the last thing that is important if you want to be successful in our business, and this is an essential trait, okay? This is an essential trait, I believe, for anybody who wants to be a remarkable creative or artist or achieve a world-class level at anything you do, actually. You will need resilience because you're going to face a lot of rejection, especially if your ideas are very original. You're going to face a lot of silence. A lot of your emails are not going to be answered because people are, are running around. They're busy with stuff. They don't need a new person in their life. And you're going to deal with a lot of instability. This is not like accepting a paycheck every two weeks from a corporation, okay? The artistic, the creative life is unstable and so in order to maximize your your chances of actually lasting in the business you have to be resilient why do so many craftspeople in our business burn out why do they not make it in the end i find it's because they allow their emotions to overcome them okay and i think emotions are a really bad master of course we are emotional because we are musicians and we work with the best language of emotion that there is which is music but that doesn't mean that we have to be emotional about our craft and our career. Those are two different things. It's good to make yourself feel in the studio. But when you're out of the studio, you, th you should think about yourself, your work, and your career like a cool captain. Like a cool, capable captain. A cool cucumber. All right? So the way that I find the most successful people are able to manage their emotions and their output, whether you know, their stuff is going up or whether it's going down is by routines and rituals, okay? Routines and rituals are the antidote for the emotional roller coaster that can be a career in the creative arts, all right? So basically what it means is that no matter what happens in your day, you have certain essential routines that you do, whether it's learning the craft or reaching out and creating new relationships with people in the business, and those happen every day, whether people respond to you or not, whether you get a project or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is that you do the march. Every day, you do a few essential routines, okay? And these numbers, I want you to think about these numbers. Next time you get emotional about things not working out for you, 315, 60, 720. You know what these numbers are? This is you emailing three people a day. This is you writing three hooks a day okay but let's call let's let's say with the email example let's say you email three people a day it's a routine every morning when you have your coffee you're like i'm going to spend the next half hour emailing three people a day after a week you have 15 people that you've emailed after a month you have 60 people that you emailed after a year you have 720 people that you emailed okay when you email 720 people, and I keep repeating this, something has to happen, okay? And I don't want you to think about the number 720. That's the key to this routine being successful. I want you to think about the number three. All you have to do, no matter what is happening, whether you're up or whether you're down, just focus on the number three every single day. We could also say 1, 5, 20, 2, 40. I once made a video saying, if you wrote one hook a day, not challenging yourself to write a hit song. No, just write one chorus a day. After a week, you have five choruses. After a month, you have 20. After a year, you have 240 choruses or hooks. Something good has to come out of 240 choruses. At least five for an EP, probably more like 10 for an album, right? So routines and rituals are the antidote to the emotional roller coaster. That's how you stay resilient. You don't focus on your feelings. You focus on your essential daily routines, just showing up.
And for work, that might mean creating a routine in the studio every day to improve the skills that you need to improve. That might mean having a routine every morning to connect with the right people, the right way, of course. And in your personal life, a routine might be something to do with keeping your mind sharp. For instance, I'm going to read one page a day of a good book, or I'm going to do a seven-minute workout or go for a 30-minute walk every single day. The key to to these routines is to do something that is very easy to do, okay, but that will actually multiply over time. And of course, keeping your spirit strong, whether it's prayer or meditation for you, that's another way to stay resilient, right? So your feelings don't overwhelm you. Remember, feelings are temporary. Strong habits are forever. Okay, folks. So we basically uh, went through our list here. We have, these are the traits, folks, of, uh, I mean, this is true to every person that I know that has succeeded in our business. They are in some way remarkable as people, so they're interesting in and of themselves, and you want to be around them because they'll teach you something new, they'll inspire you, they build rapport easily, they're very responsive, okay, so you get an email from them right away when you reach out, you know that they will deliver because their batting average is really, really good, no mistakes, on time, as discussed, resourceful, meaning that you might not know how to fix the problem, but when I call some of the people that I collaborate with, they give me ideas on how to fix the problem and that's why I keep calling them. Radiant, because life is too short to spend with grumpy people, especially in times like this. And resilient because, folks, it's not an easy life, okay? It's not an easy life. And the thing is, you don't become resilient uh, automatically. You're not born resilient. This is something that you can actually work on. There are tools and techniques to work on this and rituals And good habits, something, small actions, small essential actions that you can do daily is the best way I know how to stay resilient, okay? So now let's take a sip of the water, take a deep breath before we move on to the next section. Man, and I promise that this video won't be as long as uh, (laughs) lesson one, and that's my aim. I'm going to try to stick to that. So let's close this up and go into tools. Let me close this so you're not peeking ahead. Okay. So what kind of tools are people using in our business? And that answer really depends on what kind of style or sound you're actually um, going after. Okay. So if you're a person who records a lot of live instruments, obviously your entire signal chain is going to be different because you might have preamps, you might have sound cards. If you do electronic music in your laptop, you're not going to have a huge signal chain. You might not even get outside of your laptop, and that's okay, right? If you record vocals or violins, you're obviously going to have to focus your gear around recording the best vocals that you ha- that you can. So a good microphone, good preamp, good sound card, right? The point here is, folks, that, you know, it's not about the tools. Tools should not dictate how we work. It should be the other way around. You as a craftsperson have to select the tools that serve your unique superpower, your unique sound. It can't be the other way around. I recently read an article by some journalist who bought the latest Apple Watch. And he said, you know, I like this thing, but I'm not yet sure how it's going to fit into my life. I mean, why would you invest money into something that you don't know how it's going to fit into your life? Shouldn't it be the, the other way around, which is here is what's important in my life and here are the essential tools that I will need in order to realize what I want in my life. So I'm just saying, as musicians, we have gas, gear acquisition syndrome, right? Be careful with this because if you want to be a professional musician, the tools have to help you. It shouldn't be that uh, you're buying tools and then you're trying to figure out how to use them, Okay. And the thing is, it doesn't matter what the tools are. This is not gear sluts, okay? This is your professional career. So all that matters really is are you able to express your superpower? And most importantly, is what comes out of the speaker moving human beings in the way that the brand wants? Okay, that's that's all that matters in our business. Nobody cares 
how you do it. Nobody cares if you have a Neumann mic or if you have a Shure mic, if you have KRK monitors or Neumann monitors, if you have Avalon preamps or you have no preamps at all. The client doesn't even know what a preamp is. So all that matters is how they feel, how the people feel when your sound is coming out of the speakers. And I can tell you that I personally have done some big campaigns on my laptop. I know other composers who've done it on their laptop and the music was amazing, okay? So it's not about the tools. Having said that, we do need to cover some basics, right? So the centerpiece of your production, of your studio, is going to be your computer or laptop, okay? So the few things to keep in mind, and this is very basic stuff, and I'm not a pro at this, I'm not a subject matter expert, but from what I know, you should probably have a fast processor. Why? Because... A lot of the production that we do, there's a lot of plugins involved, right? There's a lot of audio files involved. There's a lot of MIDI files involved. And so you want a fast processor, especially in our business. This is not a hobby. Like you need to deliver quickly and reliably. So what happens if your computer keeps stuttering or, or slowing down? Well, you can't actually do your work. And that's a big no-no. I think you need big storage. Um, so I made the mistake of actually buying my iMac with low storage. I made a mistake previously of buying laptops with low storage. Now I don't do less than one terabyte. So I actually got my iMac upgraded recently. Now I have, um, I believe, a terabyte on my iMac. And my MacBook, my 16-inch MacBook, I don't know if you can see it. I don't know why I'm showing it to you. Everybody knows what it looks like. Is... Um, two terabytes hard drive space. And um, yeah, I believe that um, you should go as big as you can afford. Because also with the laptop, you're not going to be able to um, store everything on your hard drive locally if you don't have enough of a hard drive. So what that means is you're going to have to get dongles you're going to have to get external hard drive. And now it becomes a bit more cumbersome. So when I bought my laptop recently, and this is my personal laptop here, the specs, I wanted to make sure that I don't even need external hard drives. I can just plug in my headphones and I have all my plugins in there, everything I need to create great music. And, um, and it's been working out really great so far. So I have a 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro. 2.3 gigahertz, 8 core Intel Core i9. I <laughs> mean, this is like a new language of its own. But 32 gigs of RAM, and I have 2 terabytes of um, hard drive space. And as you can see, I'm using about a quarter of it. And my laptop is filled with all kinds of orchestral libraries, with native instruments, with all sorts of plugins. And as you can see, I have much room to spare. And um, that makes me feel comfortable because every day I'm exchanging really huge files. And so don't skimp, okay, on the heart of your production, okay? Whether you buy an Apple or you build your own PC like some of my friends in the business are doing, do not skimp. This is the heart of your studio. This is the new tape machine. This is the place where we communicate and we need it to communicate reliably. We need it to work. And um, so don't skimp, okay? You can skimp on almost everything else, but not the heart of your studio. So next up is headphones. Because some people that I work with, they might not even have monitors. I have composers who are, for instance, on tour. Well, they can't bring the monitors with them, but they have their headphones with them, and that's enough for them to create tracks. So some of the most popular uh, headphones that I see in our business uh, and the good news is, actually, they're not very expensive, are the Bayer Dynamics DT770s, 160 bucks, And also, these are the headphones I'm wearing right now, which I like a lot. Let me hide the mess here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Audio-Technica's ATH-M50s, okay? 150 bucks. So the good news is you don't need to spend a lot of money uh, to get really quality headphones. And this is pretty much the industry standard, okay? As far as sounds, um, this is really, really important, folks. I mean, if you look at a lot of ad campaigns, it's really, a lot of them are about a fresh sound. 
about things sounding exciting and right in your face and modern and contemporary. Not every ad is like that, of course, because we have many different genres, as you've seen in Lesson 1. But the reason why some composers actually stop getting called is because their sounds start sounding stale. They start sounding out of date. And we cannot, cannot afford that in the world of advertising. And the reason why sound is so important, like your source, where you get your sounds, it's like, what if you spend all your money on an incredible sound card and incredible laptop and all this gear, but the quality of your sounds is actually lacking, right? I mean, this is why I say it's, it's almost like, you know, because we're working in the computer a lot, I always say to musicians, be careful in how much money you spend on outboard gear that, of course, has a great reputation and a great brand, but how consequential is it? How important is it to actually you delivering really killer sound to an ad campaign? You know, is it really critical to spend $5,000 on the preamp? Or would you be better off spending $5,000 on the best sound libraries that are out there right now? It's just a question. Deadlines are deadly, so we need to work fast. So that's another reason. It's like, let's say I have a really impressive $20,000 signal chain, okay? But I have to deliver something tomorrow. Well, there's no time to be uh, twiddling with the patch bay, with twiddling with the settings of the preamp, okay? We have to deliver something that sounds intense and fully polished by tomorrow. And I find that a lot of it can be done inside of the computer. And so... I always caution people, be careful with how you invest your money as far as sounds are concerned, okay? So let me run through some of the things that uh, I use personally, okay? So I believe that the basic is basic plugin to, to, to cover a lot of different sounds is Native Instruments Complete, okay? You can, you can go to their website. I mean, I don't know if I want to go through every one of these. You probably know what Native uh, Instruments is. Uh... Yeah, bundle price six hundred instead of seven thousand. Seven thousand, really? Man, you could buy a car for that. Uh, but yeah, it looks like it's six hundred bucks or six hundred euros. This is a basic. I think every composer in our business has a native <laughs> instruments complete. I mean, that's basically where you start. A lot of people in our business have Omnisphere, which is a synthesizer, a sampler. And it just, I mean, you hear Omnisphere on a lot of different films and commercials. I think it's one of the best investments I have ever made. I think it's like $500 or something like that. But I use Omnisphere on nearly everything. And it's really inspiring. And again, I consider it a kind of a basic thing. Another thing that's popular in our industry, in the ad industry, is the output suite. And these guys are making all sorts of plugins that have very interesting sounds, that have very cutting edge sounds and textures and things like this. And very often, it's the kind of stuff you would hear in advertising, you know? Like it's these sounds that you would go, huh, I wonder what that sound is, right? So really sophisticated, really cool, really futuristic. And so a lot of composers in our business like uh, the output stuff. And I personally have the output suite and I recommend it. Serum is a synth uh, that I use. I mean, there are various synths out there that give you that modern, edgy sort of sound. Uh, $200 synthesizer. I wouldn't say it's an essential. It's not something that I would call essential. But out of all the different synths that are out there as VSTs, this is the one I use. Then orchestral libraries. Um, I really recommend, and a lot of people in our business, use the Project Sam stuff. Okay, so this is a Dutch company that delivers really high quality orchestral um, libraries and really high quality internet speed <laughs> we're dealing with now. And so if you're just getting into this world, orchestral essentials is something that I'd recommend because it's 200 euros and you really get a good bang for the buck here. Okay. Keep in mind, it's not going to be the most comprehensive orchestral library, but it is a very good library uh, for the money and it will cover your basics. I also have uh, Symphobia from Project Sam. Um, let me see if it's here. Libraries. Symphobia is more sophisticated. Yeah, Symphobia series. So I'm still on number two. Uh, Symphobia number two. Uh, let's see how much Symphobia two is. 
300 euros. I mean, yeah, so between orchestral essentials and symphobia, that's not a lot of money to spend, and you get a lot of value uh, as far as those libraries. Keep in mind, folks, I'm not a composer per se. Sometimes I compose music for a commercial, but I'm a producer, so... It's not necessary for me to keep up to date with these libraries. I like to have them in case I need to compose something. But, uh, you know, don't just take my word for, for what's good. I'm just telling you what I have on my computer. Hans Zimmer Strings, uh, something that I've used before. And um, uh, this, that's not Hans Zimmer Strings. That's uh, London Orchestra Strings. So, th yeah, that's another thing that I'll show you. Um, this is a really cool library from Spitfire Audio, which I've used a lot. Um, really nice violins and Hans Zimmer strings another li a library that I use fairly often but I would say that for the money 800 um, euros I don't use it enough in other words you could probably get away with a symphobia and uh, and not spend that much money I'm not exactly sure what other composers think about this but for 800 euros I'm not sure if I'm using uh, Hans Zimmer enough. Um, let's see. This is an instrument library from Native Instruments that has really refreshed me and delighted me. And I've used it quite extensively recently when I was uh, scoring an exhibition. And it gives you these really cool textures that you can manipulate. And I find it's a great composition starter. Just put this thing on your channel. It'll inspire you. It's where you start. Obviously, uh, this thing is not going to like create a composition for you, but it creates these really uh, beautiful and complex textures that can really get you going, uh, that you can develop into something, um, uh, into something more developed, <laughs> if that makes any sense. And another thing that refreshed me recently that I added to my arsenal and have been using is the Stradivari violin. Okay, incredible sound. 200 euros for the kind of sound that you get and the kind of manipulation that you can accomplish with the sound. I mean, there's so many parameters that you can actually control. It's really a no-brainer for me, and I would uh, definitely suggest that you check it out. As far as mixing plugins, a lot of people talk about Slate Digital. Um, I haven't used them personally, but I hear a lot of good things. And the setup with them is apparently that you pay a subscription fee of like, 10 bucks or something a month and then you get all these plugins basically i can't personally attest to them because i haven't used them waves plugins also i used to use them but you know i find they're very expensive compared to the competition and i'm just not a big fan of uh, waves i'm not saying they're bad i'm just saying that i haven't worked with them and, and that's why you know i'm not used to having them inside of my sessions but what I do do, uh, what I do use a lot is PSP AudioWare plugins. So I love using uh, the Vintage Warmer on individual tracks and sometimes on the Mix Bus. Okay, and this just really warms up your sound in a beautiful way. You can try it. I mean, I think these guys give you a um, uh, what do you call it? Um, you can download it and try it, right? Uh, and then. On my master channel, very often, I will use the Xenon. It's a very good limiter, and um, I use it a lot, so I recommend it. And also, on my master channel, sometimes on individual channels, I will use this remake of the Avidis Audio Electronics E27. And the preset that I'm addicted to is... Um, add air i think it's called air or something like this but it really gives this high frequency shimmer uh which i add to a lot of my mixes okay just before i deliver them to the clients so that's mixing plugins and folks online sample libraries um they've gotten so good you know we went away from this model of cd roms and like having to buy all these libraries with a thousand snare drums for i don't know how many uh how much money and instead, we move to this model where it's like, uh, you know, as you need. It's like a buffet, you know. Uh, you just kind of take what you need. And I really like this model, and I use Splice a lot. So when I'm working on a project and I need a snare drum, I will actually... Let me see if I can log in here. Uh, yeah, we got LastPass. LastPass, by the way, folks, I recommend it highly to keep all your passwords in place so you don't have to remember them. 
But let's say I'm working on a track and I need a snare drum. I'll just go in here and literally like type in snare and then select the snare that I like, right? Let's see if this will play. Yeah, here we go. And if I like it, but I don't want to download it, I can just like it, right? So that I can refer to it later or I can just download it. And basically, you get a bunch of credits for subscribing every single month. And it's a lot of credits, so you can download download a lot of stuff. So, so I'll come here and I'll look for loops. I'll look for uh, whooshes. I'll look for transitions, all that kind of stuff. And um, I really recommend Splice. I think they're quite good. Also, this is a company that I like, which does a similar thing as Splice. Uh, but I find that... Um, their sounds are really interesting. Um, Splice has a lot of stuff, right? Like just so many different things. And sometimes you have to sift through it and it's a problem. And with noise, N-O-I-I-Z.com, I just come on here and I check out some of these libraries. And a lot of times I'll get inspired by a certain loop or by a certain sound. And I will just use them in my composition. So, so those are definitely sounds that I would recommend to you. Okay, let's move on to sound cards. Really depends on your setup. Like I said before, if you record a lot of stuff, obviously you'll need a lot of inputs. Um, I don't record a lot of stuff. And actually a lot of composers in our, um, well, I shouldn't say that. There are some composers who record a, a lot of stuff. But out of the sound cards that I know are quite popular in our, uh, industry. We have the Focusrite, which is a really cheap sound card, and it does the job, okay? But this is for somebody who's working mainly in the box, okay? Not somebody who's recording a lot of stuff. If you're recording more stuff, then probably you'd go for something like the Apollo um, or something even bigger than that, you know, if you can afford it. I personally... Um, yeah, there's another one here, which is a Motu. I mean, all these sound cards now, you know, they're decent. I mean, it's it's not... I don't think there's a huge difference between Motu and uh, Focusrite. People might argue about it, but, you know, I'm not. I'm just not sure that there is a vast difference between them. My sound, uh, sound card of choice is the um, RME Babyface Pro. That's the one I have. The reason why I chose it is because I've heard really good things about the sound quality, the preamps, and the fact that it's very small, uh, that I can move it in case I need to go on the road uh, and work somewhere else uh, on a campaign. I can take it with me and be confident that I can record uh, whatever I need to record um, in qual with quality, okay? As far as monitors, uh, here are some of the most favorite uh, monitors that musicians use in our business. These are classics. I have these. They're not hooked up right now, but I've used the KRKs forever. And I find that for the price, you, you just can't go wrong with these. And that's why so many studios have them. A lot of people in our business like these uh, Yamaha monitors, the legendary HS series, because uh, they sound flat. Uh, that's what the people who own these Yamaha things say. Um, I've never actually used them. What I personally use is the Neumann KH120s, and I find they look slick, they sound amazing, and I really like having these monitors. Uh, but they're more expensive than the KRKs, and I'm just not sure that you need something like this, okay? Um, and there are people in our business who, you know, are so busy and I guess they have so much money to spend that they will work on monitors like this. Is it necessary? No, absolutely not. But, you know, this is more of a question of a certain passion, a certain obsession with a certain kind of gear that you absolutely want to spend your time with. And so that's fine. You know, whatever, whatever allows you to create magic, that's what you should go for. As far as MIDI controllers, this is what I personally use. So the Native Instruments Complete Control S49. And that's one of my controllers. And then the second one of my controllers is the Ableton Push, which I use. So various people use various controllers in our business. But these are the two I use, and I can certainly recommend them. Next up on our list, 
is the DAW. I hear my phone ringing. It's my wife. I will call her back. Next thing on our list is our DAW. Um, and so here, you know, you guys know what the DAWs are, what the choices are. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of people in our business use Logic because they've been with Logic for like years now. So that's what they continue to use. Um, a lot of people use Cubase also. Some people use Ableton. Now, some people are starting to use FL Studio. I mean, that was unheard of 10 years ago. And some people use Pro Tools, okay? It, it, I mean, any DAW where you can import a picture and actually create music to picture is going to work, okay? So I really have uh, no advice for you there. Pick what you feel most comfortable with. For me, it's Ableton. Ableton Live is the DAW of choice for me. Okay, folks, so that brings us to the end of the tools section. Next up, we have the skills, man. And I really want to get through this quickly because, because I don't want it to be like 90 minutes, like the first lesson. Okay, so as far as skills, I'm going to keep this really simple, okay? You are ready to start considering entering our business, making music for brands, for commercials, for campaign if you are able to create fully polished, remarkable songs, scores, or sounds fast and on your own, okay? I have some people that have mailed me and they said, look, I can compose, but I need an engineer to help me bring my compositions to life. And what I say to them is it's not impossible to get traction in our business that way. But remember that so many campaigns have a deadline. We have to do things quickly. And so the more you have to rely on other people, the longer it's going to work. The less you have to rely on people, the more you can create stuff with your own setup, the faster you will be. Okay, And that's a huge attribute in our business. So I always say you should have a setup. I don't care if it's a laptop. I don't care if it's a bedroom studio. I don't care if you have an SSS console in a fancy studio. Just know your tools, have a setup that allows you to create music quickly. Secondly, you have to great, have great sounds. Like, I don't care if you have an SSL console, if what you send me actually sounds outdated or it doesn't have that polish or that sophistication of modern production, right? So really make sure that you have invested in sounds that are relevant to what we're hearing uh, right now on brand campaigns. You are ready if you have compositional skills and not just compositional skills. Uh, you know, I don't care if you write songs. That's nice. But can you write songs to picture? Can you write songs that actually twist and turn with the needs of the picture? I don't care if you write beats. Can you write instrumental, let's say hip hop that moves and fits the picture? That's the prerequisite. You have to understand the story and the setting of a visual. You have to then select the right sounds. You have to put them in the right order, okay? And you have to make it all seamless. And that's a skill that, you know, you're always learning. Like, a lot of people ask me, am I ready to get into this business? Like, should I invest in your masterclass? I'm not sure if you're ready. The thing is, you're never going to feel ready. I'm still learning. A lot of composers that I work with are still learning. And even Hollywood composers, when they talk amongst themselves, they say, you know, every time I get a new project, I feel like I'm, I've never done this before. Okay? So there's always going to be that feeling. But you have to have some kind of sensibility around being able to express what's happening on the screen with sounds. All right? The other important thing is not just selecting the sounds, not just sequencing them into a whole, but actually making your stuff sound intense and alive and as if it's jumping out of the speaker at the right time. So it's very important to understand how to mix your stuff, okay? Your demo really needs to sound like it go on air tomorrow. You don't need to know the broadcast specs. That's not what it's about. It's just simply about someone pressing play and going, Wow, man, I can really feel this. It's moving me. And a lot of times that has to do with a proper mix, right? You don't want someone to go, that's a great song, but why is that so muffled, right? So that's what I mean by fully polished. You have to know how to fully create a fully polished production. And most composers in our business, including me, we, you know, it's not like when you work on records as an artist, you have like your songwriting stage, you have your recording stage, you have your mixing stage, you have your mastering stage we don't really work like that 
Like a composer gets a brief, they actually start composing stuff and they're mixing as they go along. And then when they're done with the composition, they might play around with some buses, with some, uh, with some limiters, with some compressors and things like this. But normally we work really quick and we mix as we go along. And all that we care about is that the composition sounds fully polished and it's doing what it's supposed to do. Okay. And so what do we have here? If you feel like you have songs, scores, or sounds that reflect what's happening in our scene, in our industry, maybe it's time to put together a reel, okay? But you got to be brutally honest in your judgment of how your work actually stacks up to the portfolios of music production companies that you will be contacting, okay? And so what you essentially need to do is research the business, Go to the websites of different music production companies, look at their reel and go, I can hear some of my stuff on their reel. I'm going to come up with more things like it. And most importantly, I'm going to notice what the difference is between a world-class standard and what I'm doing right now. So maybe I need to work on the mix. Maybe I need to work on recording my guitar or vocals better. Maybe I need to figure out how they got those drums to work with the guitar, right? So really become good at reverse engineering the process and understanding why certain stuff is working, where your stuff is in relation to that and what you need to do to bridge that gap. Now, you'll need to keep working on your craft, okay, before you try to contact or connect or break through into our business. You'll need to keep working if you don't yet have a setup of your own that you have mastered so that you can make music quickly. You're not going to start knocking on doors until you learn how to compose. So I know you might want to be doing this. You might be like, this is a perfect solution for me because I want to be in the studio. But you really need to go through a lot of cooking. You need to cook a lot of dishes before you start calling yourself a chef, okay? And we'll talk about the best way to improve your craft in a second. If your sounds are not up to par, you feel like you listen to your library you don't have the right VSTs. You don't have the right samples. I mean, you're working on outdated gear. Don't try to connect with our industry. Get your stuff sounding fresh, modern, just like everybody else is sounding. By modern, I don't mean that you need to be like Billie Eilish, but I mean, if you're an orchestral composer, make sure you have the latest orchestral library that reflects the sound that we're using today. And don't be using a, a string library from the 80s. OK, because people will hear that instantly and you'll be instantly disqualified. And if you find that your mixing is not up to par, like your your stuff sounds flat and it sounds weak and it sounds muffled and it just doesn't jump out of the speaker, you have to learn how to mix better. There's no way there's no better way to learn than by continuing to cook, be in the kitchen cooking every day. This is how I learned people. OK, the best way to learn is by doing. You can read the books, you can watch the YouTube tutorials, but that's not learning yet. Learning is when you're doing, okay? So watch the YouTube tutorial, but then challenge yourself to actually create something, a fully fil finished product, okay? So what I would recommend that you do to improve your skills is download ads that you believe reflect your superpower, that, that, that reflect your style, your sound, and challenge yourself to score one every day. Take one that's 30 seconds, okay, and download it and put it in your DAW and just score it, okay, every single day. Imagine if you did that for 90 days. In 90 days, you would have 90 pieces, 90 pieces that you could share with music production companies, 90 pieces that might uh, find a home in a future commercial campaign. If one of these music production companies calls you and says, hmm, really like that sound, can we uh, license it from you? You'll say, yeah, absolutely. But most importantly, your skills will get better if you're at this every single day in the kitchen cooking. There's no better way to get better at this craft. Okay, folks? All right. So key takeaways from our lessons today. Let's run through it quickly. Okay? Relationships are everything. And so what you need to do is get good at building rapport with others in our industry. How do you do that? By becoming a person of substance yourself by striving to be a remarkable craftsperson. How do you do that? You are what you eat. By finding heroes in high places, by consuming and digesting great works of art, by understanding 
uh, what the masters were doing and trying to copy them, okay? Be responsible. I know, I get it. We're artists, we're creative, we want to change the world. But folks, we are also craftspeople, which means we just have to be responsible. We have to show up on time. We have to show up on budget. We have to deliver what we actually promised, okay? Don't bring the vibe down by going, oh, by tomorrow, oh, another revision. No, be open, be positive, be constructive. Always say, how can I do it? And if I can't do it, who can do it? But how can I be solution-oriented to the people calling me? If you do that, they're going to keep calling you. Be positive. These are difficult times. The people you will work with are under stress. They need to deliver quality stuff in really short amounts of time. It's stressful, okay? Be positive. Be radiant. Be a source of enthusiasm. Be a source of joy. Be a source of peace. Be helpful above all. And believe me, these folks, we want to have you around in future projects. Before you can succeed in the game, you have to actually stay in the game. And so if you let your feelings be the master and things are not going well for a while, because that's the way it might be, your feelings might overtake you and they might make you discouraged and you might stop. So I recommend routines and rituals because they are the antidote to emotional roller coasters. And remember these numbers, 3, 15, 60, 720. You know what they mean. Don't focus on the 720. Focus on the three. As far as gear, folks, it's not about the gear. This is not gear sluts. We're after goosebumps, okay? That's all that matters. You need to select the tools that will serve you and your superpower, and don't let the tools be your master, okay? Select what you need. And skills, guys, in order to make it in this business, Fully polished songs, scores, or sounds that fit the picture. That's what this business is all about, okay? Check the music production company websites. See what they're displaying on their portfolios. And try to reverse engineer how far away you are from that standard. And get in the kitchen every single day. I want you to work on one piece, one commercial a day for the next 90 days. And in 90 days, believe me, you'll be a much better craftsperson. And you will have a library of music to show for it. Okay, folks, so that's been Essential Skills, Tools, and Traits for Success in Our Business. I hope you found this helpful. That is part two of our mini class. Next up will be part three. <laughs> Imagine that. After part two is part three. Uh, but that's where we're going to dive into my studio sessions. I'm actually going to show you how we make music from the inside. Hopefully, that'll be fun and inspiring for you. But for today, this is it. If you have questions, please ask them in the comments below. Uh, consider subscribing to the channel also. And um, I hope you're safe and well wherever you are. I'm sending you big virtual hugs. Tommy Z signing out. Until the next lesson. I'll see you there.